After one of our recent dedications, someone said to me, I feel a real responsibility in participating in a dedication service. And I said back, good, we should. Because we as a community of faith are saying, this is important. And we are dedicating ourselves to helping a family in the raising of a child. It is something that we find in Scripture. Even the family of Jesus brought their child to the temple for dedication, for blessing, in the belief that God desires to bring together family and the family of faith. Today, Laura and Billy do just that bringing their son for dedication. And so I want to ask each of you a couple of questions as you receive this child from the hand of a loving creator. Do you, with humility and hope, accept the responsibility which is yours to love and nurture him and to lead him to faith, not only by your teaching, but by your example? If so, please say we do. And do you ask for the power of God's Spirit, the support of family and friends, and the encouragement of your faith communities so that you may find strength in the journey that lies ahead, the journey that we call parenthood, with all of its unique challenges and joys? If so, please say we do. I also want to ask you as a community of faith, to make a statement of support. And in these words is a desire as a community to accept responsibility in the sharing of, 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 of bringing faith to not only a family, but specifically to a child. And so you have heard the commitments of these parents and their desire to raise this child in the ways of God. So will you also be a source of encouragement to them? And will you be a reflection of God's love in the life of this little one? And will you also surround each member of this family with your prayers, not just on this day, but with each day, recognizing that we have many children that make up this congregation, and I truly believe parents are blessed in knowing that they are being prayed for. If so, please say, we will. What name have you given this child? Zane Ian. Ian. This day, we officially name you Zane Ian in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now, I know this day you're just taking all of this in, trying to figure out what's going on. But your parents have said, you are not just important, you are really important. And they believe that you, as a gift from God, are something to celebrate and to dedicate to God. And so this day, I know you're kind of looking at your dad going, really? (laughs) But it's true. And even though you may not fully understand what's going on, I have a feeling they'll tell you about it. Five years from now, ten years from now in part as just a way of communicating just how important you are. That's right, you are. Yes. Can we have a prayer? Would that be okay? God, I give you thanks this day for the willingness of parents to bring forth Zane. We give you thanks for the love that has been present every moment of his life. And as a community of faith this day, God, we pray that you will inspire and encourage us so that we might be representatives of that love to this family and to every family. For you are the God who first loved us, and you desire for us to live that same love each and every day. Now bless Zane and his family. In the name of Jesus, amen. Now, Zane, I want you to look out at these people, some pretty amazing people out there. And all those folks out there have just accepted responsibility. And I appreciate the ones that are waving at you right now out there. 
They've just accepted some responsibility to be an encourager in your life, to be encouragers of your parents as well. And that's a great responsibility and one that we take seriously. And so this day, we celebrate and ask God's blessing upon you and upon your family. And I have a couple little things for you here. A certificate for this day, but also a book of prayers. It is the one that my family has been doing now for 13 years. Yeah, that'll be your book. And also a little handmade cross. That's for you as well. Oh, you're very welcome. I invite this community of faith to officially welcome this child into our faith community. I like dedications. I really do. Today we are looking at the Gospel of Luke, the fourth chapter. And I invite you to hear these words. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day as was the custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me and because He's anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then Jesus rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And then he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. These are the words of scripture for this day. Words from which we will draw inspiration and hope. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Where your church gathers, O oh God, may there be attentive ears, receptive hearts, and open minds. We desire to meet you this day in the words of Scripture. Speak to us. Amen. A friend of mine, directly out of college, worked in environmental safety. He worked for a company that would go to other companies and help them in regard to the safety of their employees, training them, providing products, and he really enjoyed the job. That is, until he started moving up into management. And it was there that he found himself behind closed doors hearing a different message. It was all about profit. Now, he understood that the company needed to make money, but it was always, always talk about how can we cut back. And he said, after a while, I felt like we were going out to our customers and saying, we want to keep your employees safe. But behind the scenes, we were producing a product that made them, in fact, less safe for the sake of making a few more dollars. How is it that 
the dreams of a creative and innovative individual, dreams that begin to form into like a, a business, a company, can suddenly become completely lost when, when they become institutionalized. How I wish the church was immune from such happenings, but it's not. Rhodes Thompson, preacher within our tradition and a wonderful teacher, Rhodes said to me one time, the church can look back to the time when it first started installing locks on its doors. That probably, in his opinion, was about the time the mission of the church began to become skewed. The mission of the church, the mission of the body of Christ, should probably look a lot like the one whose name we take, the mission of Jesus himself. And I believe that in many ways, the fourth chapter of Luke's gospel presents to us a sense of what that mission would be about. Jesus enters the synagogue and he's given a scroll. It was the tradition that anyone could read from the writings. And he unrolls that scroll and finds the place in Isaiah's writings where we read, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he's anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to announce the year of the Lord's favor. Starting about 200 years before Jesus, there was a community of Jewish people that moved away from culture. They tried to step away. They moved out to the desert. The Qumran community is what they were called. And it is believed that they are the ones that gave us the Dead Sea Scrolls, these wonderful ancient manuscripts that give great insight into the biblical texts. For the Qumran community, they were very focused on these words from the prophet Isaiah that Jesus shared in the synagogue. They believed in the messianic expectation, this idea that the Messiah was coming, the saving one of God was coming into the world, and that these words from Isaiah were, in a sense, the job description of the Messiah. And so they were looking for one that would arrive on the scene and claim that mission for himself. Now, some scholars believe that John the Baptist may have come out of the Qumran community and that even Jesus might have been influenced by that community. Whatever the case, when Jesus shows up on the scene, there is this sense of expectation. People's ears were attentive to hear these words from Isaiah. And for Jesus to not only stand up in the synagogue and read those words, but then at the conclusion to say, these words have been fulfilled in your hearing, that would have caused a buzz among the community. But was the excitement because this one standing before them might actually be the saving one of God? Or did they really hear what was being said? Did they hear the sense of mission and purpose that the Messiah was going to be about? To bring good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That's language that describes a moment in time when slaves were freed and debts were forgiven. Every one of those lines from the prophet Isaiah that Jesus read have to do with one thing. Each line, even though it talks about good news and release and recovery and freedom and announcement, every line has to do with people, with people. And yet my question this morning 
is has the church, the body of Christ in this moment, become focused elsewhere at the expense of people? This past November, a movie hit the big screen entitled Spotlight. That movie is about the newspaper, the Boston Globe's investigative team that broke the story about sexual abuse and the cover-up of it within the Catholic Church. This past November, about a month after it came out, there was an article in the New Yorker. And it interviewed, the article had an interview with the four main journalists that were a part of that. One of them was Martin uh, Barron. And he, when he arrived at the Globe a number of years ago, he was caught off guard by, by a story that appeared in the newspaper, a story about a priest that was accused of abusing 84 children. But what bothered him the most was the fact where it was found. It wasn't on the front page of the paper. It was hidden back in the metro section. Well, that started this movement towards trying to get the court to release the documents that had been sealed. And the Globe finally sued for those documents. And in January of 2001, they were released. And Walter Robinson, one of the other journalists, was to write the first article based upon those documents. And he wanted the lead to be very specific, though he was voted down. And he ended up working it into the fourth paragraph of the article. That lead that he wanted, that came out of those thousands and thousands of pages that were released, was something that, in fact, wasn't said. He said, in all of those pages, there was not a single indication that anyone cared about the children. There was not a single reference to wondering how the kids were doing. No concern about their health. Everything was about protecting the reputation of the church. Now, that I use that illustration not to bash my Catholic sisters and brothers. They're not alone here. Every different Christian denomination, every Christian tradition, and every religious group outside of Christianity has guilt and blame here. But that description in that article I found so very troubling. The utter failure of the church to keep its eye on the mission and to remember to whom that mission was to be directed, to people. In this case, to children, not to institutions, not to structures, not to buildings or boards or bureaucracies, but to people. As any movement begins to take up momentum, any new movement begins to take on some energy to it, there is this natural pull inward, a power for self-preservation. But I find that especially strange when we think about the Jesus movement, since we are thinking about and following one who gave it all away, who attempted to preserve nothing of self so that others might experience life to the fullest. Why did he do that? Because at the end of the day, it was about people. Jesus did not stand in the synagogue and say, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to protect and uphold a bunch of inanimate objects. Now, those objects may be helpful tools to the mission, but they are always secondary to the people. A number of years ago, when I was doing youth ministry, a couple of the youth approached me. They had seen commercials on TVs and seen advertisements in newspapers about these programs to help and feed children around the globe, how you could adopt a child and send a certain amount of money every month to support them, and the youth wanted to do it. 
I was pleased, excited about their interest. I posed a question to them because they had four different organizations that, that they saw doing this. I said, which one do you think is doing the best job? And they kind of thought about it. Well, how do we find that? I said, let's write each of them a letter and ask the question, how much of every dollar actually reaches the child? They wrote those letters, mailed them out, and three of the organizations, three of the four, responded. Now, their answer was not found in the cover letter. We had to dig through all the other documents that they sent. But the best of the three that responded, 26 cents of every dollar reached the child. And the worst, 11 cents of every dollar. A majority of the money was spent on the flashy commercials and advertisements and the very high-priced CEOs of these companies. These youth were distraught. Their eyes had been opened and they were disillusioned. And that's when I introduced them to Week of Compassion, our own denomination's response to people in need around the globe. And I pointed out how they're not terribly flashy and they don't buy big advertisements. In fact, they partner with other denominational organizations and often their name is not even noticed. But at the end of the day, they don't think that's what's important. It's the people. And that's the reason 93 to 96 cents of every dollar that is given actually goes to the people. If it's God's mission, it doesn't need to be protected or preserved, but proclaimed. It doesn't need to be defended. It needs to be dispersed. It doesn't need to be sheltered. It needs to be shared. Because at the end of the day, it's about people. It's about people. About seven or eight years ago, I went with four other clergy to Italy. And we were there to look at the ancient practices of the church. I ended up going to an old monastery and getting a tour of that monastery. And in the process of getting toured around, we heard about how that monastery started out as a central place in the community and how they taught hospitality, and how they brought people in when they were in need, and how they fed them during times of famine and difficulty. And then someone in our group pointed out the very tall, thick walls around the monastery and the big gate at the front of the monastery, and asked, how does that demonstrate hospitality and welcome? And I appreciated his honesty in his response at this point. He said the wall and the gate came later. It was at the point that the church in the monastery received its first communion set made of pure gold. That's when it built the wall and the gate. The protection of the church's assets eclipsed what the church was called to do. That was powerful to hear. Cypress Creek Christian Church, in my opinion, does a pretty marvelous job of having its priorities in the right place. We have a lot of buildings. We have a lot of physical space. But they're opened up to the people. What was it last year, not including church people, people coming in for worship and Bible studies, the community people, more than 350,000 people came into this space for different programs and support groups and, and places of encouragement. And just though because we, we celebrate that openness, what I want to say to our community is to be open and aware and ask the question continually, are we focused on people? Or have we begun to slip, slip over that edge? It's a question that's hard to ask 
It's a question because it requires some self, you know, introspection. And yet at the end of the day, it is not, if it is the mission of Jesus, it is not about protecting and preserving. It is about proclaiming. It is not about defending what we have. It's about dispersing the gifts that we have received. It's not about sheltering our stuff. It is about sharing all of who we are because we follow and represent the one who gave it all away. Because at the end of the day, it's about people. And when I say people, I hope you understand I'm talking about you, and I'm talking about me, and I'm talking about every human being across generations, across nat nation, national boundaries. We're talking about all people. And if we keep that in front of us, I think we'll be okay. You pray with me. God of heaven, we are humbled at the notion that you care about us. We are in awe when we begin to ponder your genuine care and concern for us. And in Christ Jesus, you, you have sought to demonstrate just how important we are to you. Today, as we pause in this time of prayer, let us take in a deep breath and to reflect upon what you desire of us. As those who enjoy your love and mercy, let us look around and see those who yearn for such an experience. Allow your Holy Spirit to encourage us in the work of ministry that is done not for the sake of ministry, not for the sake of some institution or board or bureaucracy, but for the sake of your people. And this morning, we lift up some of those people, including Margaret, Ian, Stephanie, Dorothy, Ken, Peggy, Naomi, Sarah, Charles, and Bob. We also lift up all those who wake up this morning distraught and concerned because of all the weather events along the East Coast. We also lift up the family members of those Marines who were killed off the coast of Hawaii. We lift up all those who yearn to know of your love. And we pray, O oh God, that in all things we will put your love first, a love that is intended for people, for sisters and brothers all around us. May we be your instruments. May we be the spokespersons. May we live it out so that all may know of your unconditional love. We offer these words of prayer in your most holy name and in the name of Jesus. Amen.